And the rest of the semester, which there's not much left thereof, we're going to be just basically showcasing some of the different orders. And I'll begin with three of the more primitive orders uh, that I want to talk about here in mammals. Uh, and I'll be talking about two members, two different members of one order. This is another order, and then this is another order here. Uh, Alpha Sericity, Macroscoliidae, and Tublo Dentata. Well, the ones we're going to start with there. I'm bypassing, um, I'm not going to be talking about the monocremes or the marsupials, I don't think, this semester, because just to save on time. And I want to get to some of these other ones that you haven't seen yet. So there is a, uh, you should have the outline of this. I didn't get them up till today. I apologize for that. Okay, so first of all, Alpha Sericida. The two examples here we're going to be talking about, this is a golden mole here, and this is a tenric here. Okay. Notice the name Aphrosaurisida, and I'll explain what that means here in just a minute. The next one is the Macroscoliidae, and these are known as the elephant shrews. And, and then finally, the last one there, tubula dentata, is the ard bark. Okay. Notice that Golden voles is plural, tenrix is plural, elephant shrews is plural, tubula ventata aardvark is not plural. There's only one, not one individual animal, but only one species. Okay, so where am I going with this? Okay, why am I putting these groups together? Well, there are a number of I mean, reasons to put these groups together. Primarily, they're, they're linked together uh, phylogenetically. They have similar backgrounds. But, uh, so they're, they're eutherians, but so is everything I'm going to be talking about are eutherians, because I'm not going to talk about monotremes and uh, marsupials. Also, though, these are all insectivorous. So every one of these is uh, some kind of insect eater, primarily on ants. And they're all found from the same region, afrotropical, nowhere else in the world. But before we start, I want to talk about something that you may run into it, especially if you go into uh, something with your, your state biologists or do interpretive work or something like that. You're going to hear a term, and I want to deal with that right away. Long time ago, way back in history, there was an order, and it wasn't really all that long ago. There was a there was an insect there was a mammal order known as Insectivora. So it makes sense. We hear no Carnivora, Insectivora makes sense. And in this order were all sorts of things. So basically the tenrics were in this order. That's a tenric right there, an old picture of a tenric. Shrews were in this order. There's the macrosicalia here. Uh, all sorts of different things. Some of these things you may know, some of you may not know here. A flying lemur is in this group, which are not regular lemurs, but they're, uh, I probably won't, I might not be covering them this year. Oh, but anyway, you had hedgehogs, all these things were in this order called Insectivora. Okay, order Insectivora, what, so here, here's the example, hedgehog, mole, shrews, okay. And they, basically, this order, most of them are little tiny guys, not all of them. In this, again, this is a non-existent order anymore, and I'm spending time with it for a reason. Okay. Relatively small mammals, okay. Why were they all put together into one group? Well, they were all insectivorous. So that was one reason to stick it together, hence the name. Also, they had very, very similar teeth. If you look at these teeth, they're similar to the ones that we've seen in the lab when we saw the, the teeth of the Talfidae, which is the moles, teeth of the Sericidae, which were the shrews. I showed you them. This is a mole here. This is a shrew here. This is uh, a tenric. And so they all looked somewhat similar in terms of their teeth. Okay. And this group originally contained 10 families. Okay. Then what happened was we went into the world nowadays. We, so they were based on the same group because of behavioral and morphological similarities. We've gotten away from that now. So we don't base things on behavior and morphology alone. I mean, we still do that. but. The ultimate clue is genetic information nowadays, okay? And when you looked at this group, you find it was a polyphyletic order. I mentioned this term before, polyphyletic. 
And what that means is these were different lines. They didn't share a common ancestor. So they were from different groups of animals, and they all got thrown together. They didn't belong together. So they, we call that a polyphyletic group. So as a result, Insectivora was abolished. It went away, and these guys were broken up into a different groups. Okay, so presently what they are now, uh, they're now a whole bunch, instead of having one nice, easy order to deal with here, Insectivora doesn't exist anymore. Okay, and here are some of the different changes now. So there's a new order called Eulipotyphla, and Eulipotyphla is a neat name because it means fat and blind. Okay. And they're basically they're talking about the moles. Okay, lipo, or lipo for fat, truly fat and blind is what it means. Okay, but so that includes the shrews and the and the uh, and the moles. Okay, there are five families, and they were originally uh, many. They were many of the ones in uh, Insectivora. We have them here in in uh, the Neartic region. Okay, so this this is so it's kind of important to us. Some of these, so you've already learned the skulls of these. This is the shrews and the moles, and I might be getting to them later. Okay, so uh, depending on how we set for time, I may be talking about these groups a little bit later on. So, so that's one. So, in, when Insectivora disappeared, a new order popped up called Eulipotyphla. Okay, also popped up is one I'm going to be talking about today, Opera Sorisida. Okay, and, and this is the golden moles. This is a golden mole here. This is a tenric here. Okay, I'm going to talk about them in just a minute. Okay, uh, there's another one called Iranisiomorpha hedgehogs. Uh, again, they're they're basically from the Paleartic region primarily. Might discuss the answer is probably won't get to these because they're not too exciting unless you're. I mean, people have them as pets and all that sort of stuff, but. Um, they're not something we're going to run into a tour around here except out of a pet shop. Okay. Sometimes, just want to let you know that sometimes, depending on, this is all fairly new because it was, so sometimes this is given its own order, sometimes they just make it a family up in uh, Eulipotyphala. Uh, mostly I would consider it as its own order because it doesn't really fit in. Okay. So why am I talking about this history? Why do we care about this? The problem is because of what you are going to be doing later on. Many biologists in the Neartic region, which is, in other words, here, still use the term insectivora. So you've got, like, you'll hear someone refer to an insectivore. They're not talking about all these other things. They're not talking about tenrix. They're not talking about tubal dentata. They're not talking about goldables. What they're talking about are shrews and moles. So when you see this term, and, and you're very likely to see someone talk to about it. any any state biologist probably still refers to them as in, insectivora, but they're not. So that's why I spent some time going to straighten that out ahead of time, because you'll see this term. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to again deal with these these three orders today to start with. And if I get through them, I'm going to move on to another group too, save some time. Aphrosauricidae. So it's a good name in the fact that, um, some general information about it, Afro means African or African looking, sorry means shrew. So it's, a, it's the African shrew. These are not shrews anymore though. We've changed what they are. Okay. But the name is good because they are only found in the Afrotropical region, which means Sub-Sahara Africa, and they are shrew-like, but they're not true shrews. To mention that they don't consider the true shrew. Uh, not very many species, two families, and I'm going to talk about the family names. I'm not going to go into any of the species here, but I'm going to talk about the two families of, of here. We'll mention those. Okay. So one is Chrysochloridae, those are the golden moles, and the other is Tenricity. And those are, of course, the tenrics. Okay. These are really, really primitive. They are almost, I mean, they're not that much different than the monotremes. And of course, the monotremes, they are still different. They don't produce eggs, but they still have a cloaca. Okay. Uh, 
uh, hopefully you remember what a cloaca is, that that is this, unlike this where the basically a common opening for urogenital, which is, urogenital means both urinary and reproductive. Uh, so most mammals have a urogenital opening, females have a urogenital opening, and males too. But this is also, this also has the end of the digestive tract in the same opening here. I mean, cloaca means gutter. These are, they have uh, very, very low metabolic rates. Uh, you only find them in warm to hot climates that you would find in sub-Saharan Africa. So some of these are desert dwellers, some of them are not. Okay. Uh, the, it's, kind of the, it's kind of weird because they're in these hot environments, but yet the males don't have a scrotum. So the, the, the testes are internal on them makes them completely different than other animals we're going to talk about. So, um, first I'm going to talk about the, the golden moles first, chrysochloridine. This is a good example of a golden mole. What do you notice about this animal right off? No eyes. No Got no eyes. Do, they do have eyes, but you don't ever see them, and they don't use them whatsoever. Okay, Golden moles. This isn't important, just to show you it's a small group is all I'm trying to do there. I'm ne never going to ask you how many genera are in an order or how many species are, but I want you to know if it's a big one group or a small group. This is a pretty small family here. Okay. Most of them are what we call fossorial. So that's a, a term that we've learned. Uh, terrestrial means to live on ground. Arboreal means to live in trees. Fossorial means to live under the ground. Anything under the ground is fossorial, hence the word fossil. So these guys are burrowers, or sort of kind of burrowers. If you live in sand, it's kind of hard to burrow, but they do it anyway. Okay. And if you think about them, when we think about a mole as being built for burrowing, which they are, these guys are even more built for burrowing, for living underground. Okay. Very, very short legs, very, very powerful claws. So you don't need a long leg if you're burrowing, you just need short, you're digging a hole just big enough for your body. So short legs, powerful claws, and non-functional eyes, and they're covered over. So there's still eyes there. So if you look at the skulls, there is an orbit. But the eyes are non-functional. And then basically they're just covered with fur over the top of them. So and again, if you bossuria, the last thing you have, all your eyes are good for is to get dirt in them. Okay. There's thick fur and skin on their head because that's what they're pushing with. So again, this nice way that they're built for this sort of thing. Where do you find these things? Some of them uh, are true burrowers and they live in woodlands or meadows. This is an example of one of the, the ones that live in uh, where you would, very, sim very similar habitats to moles. We see moles in, in the Neartic region here that dig uh, in woodlands and, and in meadows. So they dig regular burrows. But some of these, so that again, there are habitats like this in in uh, the Afrotropical region. But there are also, uh, as you move up in the desert, some of these live in deserts, and so they burrow in sand, which of course you can't really do. So what they basically are doing is that there's as, this is a uh, a golden mole path here. It collapses right behind them. So basically, what they're doing is they're just swimming through sand kind of stayed, they stayed below the surface. Okay. The ones in the sand often will go very, very deep. Makes sense if they're trying to control temperature. Uh, half a meter, that's pretty deep, if you think about it. And of course, the sand's going to be cooler there, and but there's not going to be much oxygen because they're surrounded by sand. And so they'll, they could go into torpor in these areas here uh, to, to relax and rest. Uh, missed another animal. So that torpor, so basically what they're doing is they are estivating. So this is one of the few mammals that estivate. I talked about a lot of mammals hibernate, but uh, not many estivate, and this is an example of one that does. So that's enough about them. The other group are tenracidae, and these are the tenrix. They kind of, again, you can see how, why they would have been put in with hedgehogs and some of those other ones. There's, there's definitely a lot of things that look alike in these groups. But again, what that is, 
Remember, morphology often comes from what's called convergent evolution. It doesn't give you an example of their background. Things often look alike when they're not at all related, and that's big in the mammal, mammal world. Also a small group, not much bigger than the golden moles. Okay. And where you find them, as there are some um, in the true Afrotropical region, mainland Africa, but a lot of the diversity is out on Madagascar. Okay. And again, if you remember when I talked first about uh, uh, zoogeography, I, I reminded that, that Madagascar is interesting in the fact that you have a number, that, that, that colonization of Madagascar was primarily, it's a sweepstakes route. And so what happened was early on, uh, probably in the, in the Paleocene, the Tenrix made it across, and then there were no other Tenrix on there, and so you had basically, there were now a whole lot of animals. Madagascar was pretty much unpopulated for the longest time, and so the few animals that made it, you had speciation, adaptive radiation. You had all sorts of examples of what's there. So we see that, uh, we see that in the lemurs. There's all kinds of lemurs there, and we haven't got the lemurs yet because they're a primate. But, uh, but it happened in the Tenrix, too. There was a lot of things that they could do in there. Okay, so as a result, you end up with these widely diverse body forms. So, if you, so in your mind, by now, with the pictures I've been showing you, you think of this little thing that kind of looks like a hedgehog. Okay. Some of them are really tiny. So less than five centimeters. Again, hopefully by now you have developed what five centimeters is in your head, only five grams. So they look very much like our shrews. So that's uh, basically shrew size down there. Anywhere from that, and this is on Madagascar, anywhere up to the, about the size of an otter. Okay. And again, what, uh, why do I use an otter? Because basically, in terms of convergent evolution, these are very similar to otters. They're uh, semi-aquatic. Uh, they feed on fish. And so again, this is convergent evolution. Okay. Again, so okay, this is basically what I've been talking about this whole time, is that you know, whenever you have an area that's been colonized, you have, you have these founder communities that come to the founder populations, and there's plenty of things to do, then you, you end up getting speciation going on. So, and then why they look like other things, it's convergent evolution. So hopefully those are two concepts that you are aware of now. Okay. Uh, lots of different, they live in a lot of different uh, habits, and habit, they have a lot of different habitats. So that, again, so these are, uh, begin because you have all these differences, unlike, you don't have, you don't see this sort of same thing in the uh, Chrysochlority group here. Uh, some are aquatic, some are semi-aquatic forests, some, are, some live underground, some live above ground. So it's, it's a very, very interesting group. So I uh, just mentioned, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about them, though. Okay. All right. So that is basically Afrosauricity. So one, that's one order. That's so we should be shooting through orders here rather quickly. Later on, we'll take more time with orders because they're bigger and more important to us. The next order I want to talk about, again, also Afrotropical, but it's a completely different order. It's Macroscheleidae, and these are known as the elephant shrews. Of course, they're not shrews, and they're not elephants either, for that matter here. Uh, you, they're, they're throughout southeastern Africa, so in your mind you should be seeing the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, uh, over Eritrea, Somalia type areas where they're from in southeastern Africa. Okay, and uh, about them, okay, they have these, they're, they're, have strong olfactory sense, good sense of smell, like many mammals do, not so much us, but many other animals do. And they have these long noses, and as a result, and it's very flexible, the nose. So that's what gives them the name elephant shrews. They're more properly known as sengis, just to let you know, or sengis, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Uh, is, uh, is what they're often more likely to be called nowadays. Where do you find them? These guys are, they look like rodents. They look, they've got a real mouse look about them, if you can see it, except for that face. Uh, and they, they are, uh, they are rodent-like in many, many respects. Okay. 
These guys can jump, they're fast, they've got really strong back legs, which is, of course, that's a little different than rodents. We don't see that in rodents that much. Okay. And these guys are, in terms of their habitat, these again, everything I'm talking about today is insectivorous. So, uh, nothing, so they all eat the same sort of thing. They're all bug eaters. Um, a lot of mammals feed on insects. These guys are daytime, which is really rare for a lot of mammals, if you think about it, you know, go back. The ancestral trait is we were nocturnal, and these guys are diurnal, and usually when you think of rodents in that, they tend to be nocturnal. Uh, similar to a lot of our rodents, like voles, which we'll be talking about later that we have around here, uh, they build trails and have these really, really complex systems. Uh, and this is their, it not only does this get them to their food sources, but this is how they protect themselves, is they have these long, remember they're fast, they can jump, and so they build these long systems of trails, if anything gets on them, they're gonna basically go hopping down one of these trails, take off, you know, go in a very, very, they, they have a, num a number of different escape paths down their trails, okay? And so again, they, there's, I tried to get a video, there is, there's some videos I know, had much luck bringing them up, of these guys running, they're pretty hysterical, how they run these trail systems. They're, when, you know, if you're diurnal, you can't stay in one place too long. You've got to move around fast. And so they, they basically that's what they do. Okay. Macroscheletic, that's all I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about any of the individuals and all that because that's all, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with that group here. I just want you to be aware of it and what it is. And the last of these, at one time, in, insectivore groups was the biggest of all of them. And now it's its own order. Tubula dentata, and this is an example. There's only one species in this entire order. There's only one family, only only one uh, genus, only one species, and this is it right here. Okay, it's an aardvark. So, so one of the first words in the dictionary, aardvark. Okay. It's that's actually uh, that's an Afrikaans term, which means it comes from Dutch originally, and it means earth pig. Is what it means. Okay. Only one family, Oryctere okay. topodidae, and an Oryctere oropus, okay, Afro, okay, is, is the one species of hardbark. They're pretty, okay, they're rainy, they are Afrotropical, and unlike the other ones, the other, okay, so like Chrysal, Chloridae, uh, most of the, uh, macro, uh, the Afrocerisids were kind of up around here, and then the Macroscheleids were over here. These guys are entirely anywhere in the Afrotropical region you can find them. They're, they're very, very uh, successful. So this, again, that's everything Afrotropical. Don't find them on Madagascar. They never made the trip. Okay, so they were not one of the winners of the sweepstakes. But uh, very, very common throughout... Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, the name is Dutch, which is well, not in Dutch that has been bastardized into in Afrikaans. You know, a lot of different languages get changed around. In fact, English is really sort of a bastardization of Dutch. So, um, uh, but so anyway, it means earth pig. About these guys here, they're really kind of cool. Uh, so. Hearing and sense of smell is really, really good. So when, you, when we talk about the fact, oh, they're good for hearing, or what immediately pops out of our mind is, oh, that's how they protect themselves from predators. Now, hearing, they can hear ants in the ground. And that's what basically what they can do. They can smell ants in the ground. Okay. And we're going to see these, this, this feature here, these long, sticky tongues. This is going to appear in a number of different animals we talk about throughout this class. Sure, that's not what I think it is. Excellent. Uh, so uh, again, uh, that if you're an ant feeder, an insect feeder, it's a great uh, thing to have. Okay. These guys, they are nocturnal as can be. So out at night, have uh, you can't really see the claws on this guy here. They have really strong claws. Uh, uh, they are. The only time they come together is for mating. Uh, 
and the rest of the time they are singular as can be. Okay. Uh, their feed food on uh, termites and ants. And if you think about that region of the world, termites and ants are, um, we, we think of Africa, we have a tendency to think of antelopes and gazelles and things like that. Uh, actually, it is the world of the ants and termites. So, uh, so uh, a lot of, of the communal insects, the youth social insects live down there. And they tend to build these massive nests. Uh, you probably saw sometime in your life seen the, what they, these towers they build. What they do is basically they build chimneys because they want to keep, they have to keep the temperatures at a certain temperature. And a great way to keep the temperature low is to build an air shaft because the hot air rises out of it and you have cool air coming in. And so ants and termites build these air shafts. And it's basically when they're done building them, they, they, they use dirt, they mix it with their saliva and they build concrete. These things are as hard as concrete. But that won't stop an aardvark. They smell or no things are inside because their, straw, their claws are so strong they could basically rip apart concrete. Okay. So, so they're able to trap these mounds. There's an aardvark working on a mound here. And you can figure out what you get inside there. I mean, you're in Fat City. It's a good, good choice. You can get all, all the ants you ever want. Okay. And of course, they get that long tongue, stick it down the passageways, and, and just uh, eat all the ants they want. Okay. That's all I want to talk about those groups. I'm going to slip on to three, this is like high speed families today, high speed orders. The other group I want to talk about, three more orders, I think three. So these are the next three orders, and these, some of these are more familiar to you. Some of them, you've, at least one of these critters you've seen dead on the roadside. At least two of them you've seen their skulls. So, uh, you do at least, so Singulata, Pilosa, and Polidota. Two of these are closely related, one is not. So, okay, who are they? Okay, again, these, so Singulata are armadillos. This is one we all know, Daisyplus novemcinctus. We'll be talking about it a lot too. Okay. The other two orders are uh, the other order is uh, order Pilosa is broken into two groups, anteaters and sloths. And the three I'm showing you here are relatively closely related. Believe it or not, an armadillo is pretty closely related to a sloth and an anteater. Then the last group here, which gets in the news all the time recently, gets blamed for things it probably shouldn't be blamed for. And this is Folodata, these are the pangolins. And we never heard of pangolins. In what context have you heard of pangolins? Some clown came up with the idea, oh, they're the source of COVID. Okay, they're not. Okay. So I've heard other cultures will use their scales for medicine. And for oh yeah, we, we like get that. to that. That's actually the last thing I want to end up with is the fact that this is probably the most endangered mammal on the face of the earth. Okay, so why are they, these, why is this group together here? This is an old, I'm sorry it's in a language you don't understand, but that's okay, I don't understand it either. But it was a good picture because it showed them grouped together, okay? Again, they're insectivores for the most part, not all of them, the sloth breaks the rule on that, okay? And they once were also in the same order, but not insectivora, it's the same sort of deal. This order was called edentata, okay? means toothless. So edentata, this is where uh, aardvarks got, so aardvarks, of course, they were in tubula dentata now. They were in this group originally too. So there's the aardvarks right there. Uh, but, and there's anteater, paglion, armadillo, sloth. Uh, this is uh, something else. So, okay. Now, so, all of them have certain similar characteristics. They look alike. Primarily, it's their teeth, okay. or lack thereof. There's the very, very 
limit either they don't have teeth or their teeth are highly reduced. These are the ones that do have teeth are homodonts, which is a little different from us because we're used to seeing heterodonts. Okay. Again, this is another name that uh, you may hear, especially uh, with armadillos. I hear people refer to them as edentata. So again, if you the same guy that's saying insectivora might be saying edentata when we know it's it's not insectivora anymore. It's ulip, ulipotypha and singulosa. Singul yeah, singulata. Okay. So again, same deal. They're all thrown together, polyphyletic. So, so edentata doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And it wasn't that long ago it did exist. So let me, so get, uh, let me show you how these things are kind of grouped together here. Okay. So uh, there's basically anteaters and sloths are closely related. Okay. Anteaters and sloths, they're both in order pilosa. Okay. And, uh, but order pilosa and singulata, okay, so, so armadillos are kind of closely related to them, but not close. So they put in this, this is a term that uh, I showed you this term early on, Xenartha. Uh, that is a superorder. So, so yeah, so what it is is basically they're two distinct orders, but golly, golly gosh, they're close together. So they've been put into the same uh, superorder. You notice that Folodota has nothing to do with it. The pangolin doesn't get to play with these guys here. But it's just in this lecture because it was in the old Enotata. So, so again, so anteaters, don't worry about these terms. I'm never going to use these terms. Uh, but I just wanted, so pilosa and singulata are the two orders we're talking about here. Okay. Yeah, folodata is not closely related to them. In fact, if you look at it genetically speaking, they're closer to the carnivores. But again, they don't have, they don't have carnivorous teeth or anything like that. So let's talk about this one. This is a group I want to spend most, most of my time talking about Singulata because this is one we know and love. Okay. About these guys here, uh, basically, uh, when I learned it, it was one family, Daisy Dality. But now it's often considered two different families uh, uh, because there's some real big differences in some of the, some of the, the, the armadillos versus some of the other ones. There's more than one species, as you can see. So, uh, we're only, so there's, basically there's another 20 species that we haven't run into in North America. Okay. Okay. Daisy Podidae is the family that we know, okay? And the ones that get separated are known as the pink fairy armadillos. If you haven't seen one of these, you're going to show you a picture of one of them. They're cute as can be because they're little tiny things and so they, they get, often get put into that. Everybody else is in Daisy Podity. What do they look like? Okay, we, uh, this is us. This is the obvious things you know. They're cut, they've got bony plates. It's actually keratin is what the primary thing. These plates have a protein cover on them. Okay, and depending on what species we're at, those plates may go all the way down on the legs. They don't go down on the legs of our, of our armadillos, the third of the nine-banded armadillo. And these bands, the bands that allow the animal to bend, just like on a suit of armor, there's places where they can allow them to bend. And the number of bands, of course, are used for identification because, because they don't all have the same. Rounded back, yeah. Uh, these guys are also fossorial, so they have the classic fossorial legs, powerful legs, strong claws. They are really good diggers. Uh, you know, yeah, so the South Lake does vary. Okay. All of them, again, have the, their insectivores, so they have that long tongue used for thing. And their teeth are homodont. Small, peg-like teeth, no incisors, no canines, everything is molar premolar on the side. Again, you've all seen the skull of an armadillo, so again, every, I mean, there's nothing new you're learning here in these pictures. And there is some variability in the size. Uh, presently, 
And as I'm going to talk about, historically, there's huge variability in the size of these things. They've been around a while. Okay. This is where they're at. Okay. Primarily, without a doubt, they are neotropical. Okay. So basically, neotropical, of course, is everything from about here down. And one major exception in the Arctic is the one we all know, and that's the Nine Bandit. Primarily insectivorous again, everything I'm talking about today, except for the sloth, are insectivorous. Okay. And they are burrowers, that was a nice hole on it does. They live in the holes, they, they come out, they're nocturnal, come out and forage at night. Okay. And uh, yeah, they build their own burrows, they don't use the burrows of other animals, uh, they live in them a lot. Uh, some, not the ones we have, but for example, the, the pink fairy armadillo I'll be talking about later is strictly fossorial. It means it never comes out of it, pretty much never comes out. Okay, so here are my examples here. This is the first one I want to talk about. This is a glyptodont. And you notice it's a drawing, because they are not, they are extinct. But they're still important. Every now and then I'm going to talk about important extinct mammals in this class. And this is one of the ones I want to talk about here. I'll talk about some more a little bit later on. Glyptodon. Okay. Okay. And these things were huge. Really big. In fact, they kind of look like something nowadays. Okay. So 11 feet long, 5 feet high, over 2 tons. That is a big armadillo. Okay. So to me, when I look at them, they... In size and shape, they look a whole lot like something you've all seen. And that's a VW. Okay. <laughs> when I always think of, when I first saw a glyptodon picture, I'm like, oh wow, what did they made in Germany? Okay. Uh, tail was very, very spiky, lots of speculation as to why this might be, again, how, they, how the males just set up their territory. Who knows? You got, they haven't been gone that long, by the way. They've been, they, I'll talk about why they're extinct now, okay? okay. But again, so 10,000 years ago, they were still around. So that's, you know, that's not that long ago. I mean, there were plenty of humans around 10,000 years ago, which uh, probably is why they're not around. Uh, two things that might have, uh, if you, things that died down, out 10,000 years ago, generally the two things we point to, and there's a lot of mammals that died, there's a great mammal die off 10,000 years ago, in fact, it's basically still going on, uh, it's just picked up speed. Uh, it, the usual suspects are hunting pressure, and this is also a period of major climate change going on. Uh, things, the glaciers are retreating, the earth is warming. Okay. Again, so again, where did these all exist? They were primary anywhere in neotropical. So Mexico, Central America, South America is where they were. And the only species that made it up here, in, uh, in one species made it into the southwestern U.S. of, of this group here. So they, we did get glyptodons. So glyptodons did make, the, again, this, how did they get here? This is part of the great American faunal exchange that took place. I talked about that before. When... Uh, but because of volcanic activity, Panama and the other countries of Central uh, America formed and combined these two great land masses, the Americas were combined. Some things went south, some things went north. He's one of the guys that went to the north. Okay, existing armadillos. This is one, this is not our armadillo here. Okay. This is the giant armadillo. Okay. It's the biggest one that exists today. It's nothing compared to, of course, the glyptodon. But still, a uh, 70-pound armadillo would be pretty impressive on these guys here. And you notice it's got the, the scaling all over its legs. Okay. This is the other one I want to mention here. This is a pink fairy armadillo. Aren't they just the cuter than anything here? I want one as a pet type thing. Yeah. So a little tiny. Uh, so 150, 15 millimeters at most. So we're not, just a little thing. They're holding here. This is the three-banded armadillo. So I wanted to show you that one. 
too. So again, this is a South American one, and I talked about before, and you can see there's the three bands in, in its group there. This is the one, uh, the nine, and we're the nine band. The three banded is the one that can roll itself into a complete total ball and be tight. Okay. So, and then this is ours. This is the one I want you to know about mostly. Gazepus, Novum Synctus. So I want to talk a little bit about that today for sure. Okay. Um, when I talk, these guys have strange behavior. Uh, we've talked about behavior here. Or, or you may have known if you've done any sort of work on life history of animals or any interest in that. You've probably heard a lot about armadillos because they're so weird. So I'm focusing on traits of the nine banded here. So first of all, they do something called polyembroing. Okay, and what that means is, okay, what they do, just like every other animal, is chemi, gamete comes together, forms a zygote. Uh, and what happens is the zygote then splits into two cells, which should be an embryo, which splits into four cells, which should be an embryo all the way up until the blastula is formed, and then eventually becomes the fetus. Well, these guys do something different. And that is basically, it goes from uh, the zygote becomes two cell stage, it goes to the four cell stage, and then at the four cell stage, each one of those cells suddenly thinks they're the embryo again. And so as a result, you produce, you get multi-embryos forming from a single zygote. The zygote basically forms four cell stage, and then it becomes each one of those acts as a zygote, which then produces an embryo. Okay. It happens in a lot of different populations. It happens in humans. Okay. Again, humans, uh, when you have the case of the identical twins, that's exactly what's happened here. So um, everyone in their life has known at least one pair of identical twins, and that's basically what happens, uh, this sort of thing. But in these guys, it happens all the time. Base, so, and what it is is not simply uh, the two cell stage, thinking each side thinking of the zygote. It goes to the four cell, then it happens. So as a result, that in general, when they reproduce, they they, they have four offspring and they're identical. So, so basically, by identical, I don't mean they look alike. I mean they all look alike. But what it is is they have the same genetic code. So, which is, you know, I don't care how closely related you are to your brother or sister, unless you're identical you don't have the same genetic code. Okay. How they defend themselves, of course the classic thing, okay, the three banded does this, you can see this is the top of its head right here, there's its tail, and it can fold itself into a complete and total ball. The nine banded, people think the nine banded can do this, it can't. It, it can hunker down and hide its parts, but it, it can't form the tight ball. Okay. Their big defense is what's called, it's known as diamatic behavior, uh, springing up is where you, if you're under attack, you startle your predator just long enough so you can make an escape. Uh, lots of animals have diamatic behavior. Um, um, a, have you ever quartered an opossum? What does an opossum do when you corner him? Where's the first thing an opossum does? It's, it opens its mouth as wide as it can and shows you its teeth. Okay, the idea is to scare you. Whoa, don't want to mess with that. Just long enough. Okay, but basically you can still grab it by the tail. Possibly not that tough. Lots of animals have this sort of, I call it diamatic behavior. Or, well, it's not what's known as diamatic behavior, where they'll they startle, they try to startle the prey. Well, they're just jumping. Is that why when you run them over, you hear that kafunk on the uh, bottom that's, of the car? Yeah, because it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, if you're going to truck a business, <clears throat> an armadillo, you have to swerve all the way around it. You can't straddle an armadillo because it jumps right from the end of the carriage. Yeah, so that's what happens. Okay. The other thing too is they're hard to drown. If if you've ever tried to drown an armadillo, what's wrong with you? If you have, but okay. So they're very good swimmers, and they can hold their breath a long time. In fact, many of them don't even swim; they just walk across the bottom of ponds or walk across streams. So. The fact that, you know, when people hear, hey, you know, talk about armadillos are now in this part of the country. Armadillos were originally from the southwestern part of the United States. And it's like, well, how did they get here? Not much going to stop them. You know, they, they just, eventually, as things warmed up, they moved their range to the north. So. They can also contract, another thing about them, is we used to study Hansen's disease. Uh, Hansen's disease is a bacterial infection. 
uh, and you probably know of its more poetic name, leprosy. So, uh, so they can get it as a result, uh, they can carry it. Uh, so when I, I always tell people, you, you've got to really, when you're working with armadillos, you really got to exercise caution. Uh, leprosy is curable if you catch it earlier, but you're going to be on antibiotics for many, many years. So it's best to avoid it and not. So if you're, if you're dealing with armadillos, uh, and a lot of people, I think people bring in armadillos, I, which I use them all the time, but you just have to exercise a lot of caution, you know, maintain cleanliness when you deal with armadillos. Okay. So they are naturally infected with the bacteria. So they, they get it all the time. Uh, a lot of people I know who study leprosy, basically this is their model organism. They, they use armadillos. I just said that. Okay. Okay. How do you know an armadillo is in your yard? So there are a lot of things that dig. Okay. So probably the, the three big diggers around here are squirrels, skunks, and armadillos. Squirrels and skunks, their digging looks very much alike. What they do is, so squirrels are digging because they're either burying their nuts or they're trying to find their nuts again, which they are amazingly poor at doing. Okay, they, nothing, you know, you, you think with a you know, brain the size of an acorn you could find something, but no, you can't. They're, worth, they're really bad at burying so. uh, Skunks <coughs> are insectivores, and so they, they also are diggers, they have strong claws, they smell things in the ground, and they dig a hole where they smell something. Armadillos don't do that. Armadillos basically put their nose down and ram it, and will dig these long pathways. They look like an earth mover has been through a yard. So this is a classic example of armadillo sign. Okay, so this is a really behavior. This is probably, a, this is a really ex excessive picture, but it's the right pattern. You'll see this one single kind of serpentine pattern. So I'll dig around trying to, looking for things as they go. Okay. Texas has several state animals, and for whatever reason, the armadillo got claimed as one of their state animals. Just don't know why that's important, but I thought I'd tell you that. <coughs> okay. I think, yeah, I, I got enough time to do pilosa. I think I do. No, I don't. I don't want to do pilosa, because it's a little bit different. Let's save pilosa for later.